many extreme climbers who've attempted to summit Mount Everest never returned home, but only one vanished without a trace. This is the most shocking disappearance in Mount Everest history. We begin our story in Chamonix, France, a world-renowned ski resort where Marco Sofredi was born on May 22, 1979. Marco grew up surrounded by the mountains and surrounded by extreme sports. His father was a mountain guide and the whole family were expert skiers. It was in Marco's blood. But he knew better than anyone the dangers of living amongst Europe's highest mountain peaks. He lost his older brother, Pierre, to an avalanche when he himself was just 18 months old. Though skiing was part of his family's legacy, Marco was drawn to the growing popularity of snowboarding. By 1995, he made the switch, captivated by the freedom it offered, and he never looked back. Within a year, he had mastered the sport and was already pushing his limits, surrounded by snow-capped mountains. The lure of the extreme was too great to ignore. In 1996, he successfully descended the Mallory, an intricate route on the north face of Aiguille du Midi. This popular tourist destination, rising to 12,400 feet, can be accessed by a lift. Most visitors stand at the summit, admiring the 360-degree views of the French, Swiss, and Italian Alps, with Mont Blanc towering in the distance. Extreme skiers and snowboarders, however, can choose one of three routes down the sheer face of the mountain. Those who choose the Mallory route experience more than 3,600 feet of no-fall skiing, which basically means if you fall, you die. Despite its reputation as the gnarliest run in the world with a status bordering mythical, Marco wasn't content. He didn't want to be like the other extreme skiers and boarders. He wanted to break out on his own, take on a challenge that nobody had ever done before. He wanted to be a pioneer, not an ordinary snowboard punk that some believed he was. But his determination to become the greatest was pushing him to his absolute limits and beyond. If you want to find out what it's like to snowboard down the highest mountain in the world, then stick around and we will show you. By the age of 22, Marco had a list of accolades under his name. He was the first to snowboard down the Mont Blanc face of the Aiguille Verte and the north face of the Aiguille de Midi in the Mont Blanc Massif, but Europe didn't have the highest peaks in the world. Marco strived for more and set out on an expedition to Nepal in 1999. There, he successfully climbed and then boarded down Dorje Lapka, a towering peak that stands at nearly 23,000 feet. During the descent, Marco paused to take in the breathtaking view. In the distance, he could see Mount Everest towering above the other mountains in the range. Seeing Everest in the distance sparked an idea in Marco's mind, one that pushed him to consider an even bigger challenge. But Everest was no ordinary mountain. It was the ultimate challenge. Marco knew this wouldn't be a decision to make on a whim. To prepare himself both mentally and physically, he sought guidance from Russell Bryce, a seasoned climber who had led 17 expeditions to the summit of Everest. Russell's expertise would be crucial in helping Marco ready himself for the monumental task ahead. To prepare for the ultimate climb and the descent back down, Marco practiced on some of the world's highest peaks, including Chooyo in Nepal and Huayna Potasi in South America. He was acclimatizing to extreme altitudes and pushing his limits beyond what he had already achieved on some of the steepest slopes, such as the Nant Blanc on the Aiguille Verde. While he had mastered many steep descents, he hadn't yet ridden at such high altitudes. At these heights, the thin air added an extra level of danger to an already perilous adventure. After completing extensive altitude training and adding more impressive mountains to his list of achievements, Marco set out for Nepal. He hired Sherpas to assist with his equipment as he began the two-month process of acclimatizing at base camp. With his preparations complete, Marco was ready to embark on his ultimate challenge. But suddenly, he found himself in a race. Dr. Stefan Gott from Austria was also aiming to be the first person to snowboard down Everest. To Marco's dismay, Stefan was already a day or two ahead of him. Even so, Marco pressed on, and on May 23, 2001, just a day after his 22nd birthday, he reached the summit of Everest. While most people spend little more than 15 minutes at the top due to the extreme cold and low oxygen, Marco stayed for nearly an hour, resting and regaining his strength. For him, the adventure had only just begun. The most treacherous 
and most exciting part was still to come. Stefan God had already made his way back down, but he hadn't snowboarded the entire descent. In fact, he had climbed and trekked for a significant portion of the way. All Marco needed to do was make it back to base camp without getting off his board, and the record would be his. But then, a major problem arose. Marco had planned to descend via the Hornby Couloir. He had studied every hazard on its steep slopes and memorized every turn, but it soon became clear that he could no longer take that route. Marco had chosen to take on the challenge in the spring, as the lighter snowfall gave him the best chance of reaching the summit. However, the wind-battered Hornbein Couloir had been stripped of its snow, leaving it bare and exposing solid rock instead of the pristine white snow he had hoped for. At the summit, Marco made the decision to descend via a different route, the Norton Couloir. He was preparing for the biggest challenge of his life, but then disaster struck. He discovered that the freezing conditions had snapped his snowboard binding, threatening to end his record attempt before it even began. Things weren't going well, and it seemed as though these might be warnings that Marco shouldn't take on the challenge. Fortunately, one of the Sherpas managed to fix the binding with some bailing wire, and Marco was on his way again. Marco carved his way past the steady stream of mountaineers trudging toward the summit, many of them barely believing their eyes as he soared past. He skillfully navigated the steep slopes and rocky outcrops until he reached the North Pole, where he took a rest for about an hour. The descent couldn't have gone better, and Marco made it back to the advanced base camp in under four hours. He had set the record for the longest continuous snowboard descent in history and became the first to ride uninterrupted down the highest peak in the world. But Marco's next goal was already decided. He wanted to snowboard down Everest again, but this time via the Hornby Couloir. The decision shocked his friends and family, who feared for his safety, but Marco dismissed their concerns. If we don't do stuff that is a bit crazy at 20, we're not gonna start at 50, he said in response to their remarks. This time, he raised 45,000 euros of his own money to fund the adventure. On Thursday, August 8, 2002, Marco departed Chamonix and headed for Nepal. But he left something behind his good luck cross, which he always carried on his expeditions. Would it make a difference this time? When he reached Kathmandu, he checked into the Hotel Tibet and contacted the three Sherpas who would be accompanying him up the mountain. Furba, Pa Nuru, and Da Tenzing. Two days later on August 10th, the team arrived at Everest Advanced Base Camp. Marco looked around in awe and surprise. The landscape was completely different from his springtime visit the year before. A blanket of snow covered everything, and there was no one else in sight. What had once been a hive of activity, full of eager mountaineers, was now completely deserted. Over the next two weeks, Marco and the Sherpas prepared for their ascent, spending time acclimatizing and ferrying supplies to higher camps on the mountain. However, the mountainside where Marco planned to snowboard in just a few days was riddled with avalanches. Heavy snowfall clung to the steep slopes, ready to fall at any moment. Trudging from advanced base camp to camp one and then on to camp two was a slow and exhausting process with the team often wading through waist-high snow. This is one of the many reasons mountaineers avoid climbing Everest during the summer months. It's monsoon season, and at those altitudes, the heavy rains fall as snow. But there's another, equally dangerous reason. Storms. The weather on Everest is unpredictable at the best of times, but during the summer months, storms can hamper any ascent attempt in the blink of an eye. Marco relied on Jan Geitzendonner, his weather forecaster back in Chamonix, to monitor conditions. They communicated via satellite phone throughout the expedition. Over the next couple of weeks, Marco was repeatedly forced to turn back from each camp as storms hit, heavy snow threatened their progress, or conditions became too dangerous to continue. But soon, Jan forecasted a clear window just days ahead. The clearest skies were forecast for Saturday, September 8, 2002 so Marco declared that would be summit day. However, the Sherpas urged him to delay. Another Sherpa was heading up the mountain with a better radio, which would allow Marco to communicate with them during his descent, as well as with base camp. But the man with the radio was still a day or two away, and when September 8th arrived, Marco didn't want to miss an opportunity of a clear weather window. 
Against the advice of his Sherpa team, Marco set off for the summit. When he reached Camp 2, he told his parents that he was still at base camp, not wanting to worry them. However, on Saturday, September 7th, Marco and the Sherpa set off from Camp 3 at 1.30 a.m., hoping to reach the summit later that day. However, the going was tough, and wading through waist-high snow slowed them down tremendously. They inched up the mountain at a snail's pace. The team had entered the notorious Death Zone, an altitude above 26,000 feet where the oxygen levels are too low to keep the human body alive for long. Twelve and a half hours later, at 2.10 p.m., the team finally reached the summit of Everest. They had made it. For most people who summit the highest peak in the world, reaching the top brings a sense of euphoria. But for Marco, the trek to the top was only the beginning of his adventure. It wasn't his end goal. But his greatest challenge was still to come. Looking down below, they saw ominous clouds gathering. The Sherpas immediately warned Marco about the changing weather and advised him to reconsider his plan. But Marco had come too far. This adventure had been over a year in the making and had cost him 45,000 euros. While Sherpa Furba helped pack Marco's backpack with a fresh canister of oxygen, repel gear, and a three-liter water bottle, another Sherpa snapped a photo of them. It turned out to be the last photo taken of Marco. In the photograph, he is standing, strapped into his snowboard, perched on the top of a steep drop-off, wearing an all-in-one yellow jumpsuit, hat, goggles, and gloves. It is a breathtaking shot, taken high above the clouds. At 3 p.m., much later than they would have liked, Marco slid off the peak and began carving through the highest fresh snow in the world. A few yards down, he paused to catch his breath and let the Sherpas catch up. They clung to the rope that had been laid out, and when they caught up with Marco to say a final farewell, he was already breathing heavily. The 12-hour climb had been grueling and had sapped his energy. Now carrying a backpack at 29,000 feet while making tight turns on the steep slopes was proving to be a challenge. A moment later, Marco let go of the rope and snowboarded away from the Sherpas, heading toward the Hornbein Couloir. By then, it was enveloped in billowing clouds, and at 3.15 p.m., the Sherpas watched as the small dot of Marco disappeared from sight. Marco was facing the challenge of a lifetime. He believed he could make it because he had done it before. But one wrong move, one lapse in concentration, and it could be all over for the 23-year-old. The Sherpas headed straight down the mountain as quickly as they could. They had spent far too long at such a high altitude. It was getting late, and a storm was approaching. They needed to reach safety before nightfall. But then, something inexplicable and chilling happened when the Sherpas were packing up at Camp 3. Something caught their eye. They looked down the mountain, nearly 4,000 feet below them, and saw a figure on the North Coal. It immediately struck them as strange, as they knew they were the only people on the mountain. The distant figure was perched on the mountainside. It then stood up and slid silently down the mountain. The Sherpas were speechless. What exactly had they just witnessed? They hurriedly packed up their belongings and headed toward the North Col. They made their way to the spot where they had seen the distant figure, but there were no snowboard tracks, no sign of anyone at all. That's when it hit them, a grim realization that what they had seen was an apparition and that Marco was no longer alive. When Marco didn't return to base camp, their worst fears were realized and a search and rescue operation was initiated. However, adverse weather and hazardous obstacles made it incredibly difficult. Despite the deployment of helicopters and canine units, they found no trace of Marco. There are many theories regarding what happened to Lange Blanc, the Blonde Angel as he had been nicknamed. With no real evidence and no tangible clues, it is impossible to conclude what happened to him. The theories are merely speculation, one theory is that as Marco traversed the mountain before entering the couloir, he may have triggered an avalanche that swept him away and buried him. Equally plausible is that he lost his footing and skidded straight into a bergschrund, an incredibly deep crevasse or crack in the ice sheet that can be more than 300 feet deep. If the impact didn't end his life, then being trapped at those depths would have. Perhaps the most comforting theory comes from Marco's sister Shudi. She believes that Marco made the descent but decided to remain in Tibet, 
living among the mountains, always pursuing the highest peaks and ultimate ride down them. Despite these speculations, Marco's body was never found, and the exact cause of his disappearance remains a mystery. A month after Marco's eerie disappearance, a memorial was held for him at Everest Base Camp. His family, along with his girlfriend, closest friends, and a group of Sherpas who had shared Marco's infectious enthusiasm for the challenge and helped him along the way, were all present. Marco's high-altitude achievements earned him immense respect among the most extreme skiers and snowboarders. He achieved more than most in his short life, but for him, it was never quite enough. <laughs>